Okay, uh, so good morning everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Kayla Brown. I'm one of the uh, curators here at the Royal Trail Museum. Uh, on behalf of the Royal Trail Museum and its uh, cooperating society, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, 2024 Royal Trail Museum Cooperating Society Speaker Series. Uh, the Cooperating Society is a nonprofit charitable organization that supports research, education, programming, exhibits, and local community initiatives uh, throughout, uh, through the management of the museum shop and the administration of donations and memberships. Uh, the Cooperating Society plays a key role in helping the museum achieve its mandate, including supporting the speaker series. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, this morning's speaker, Dr. Philip Curry. Uh, professor of Biological Sciences at University of Alberta. So Phil will be familiar to many of you in the audience today, given his long history with the Royal Toronto Museum. Phil obtained his Bachelor's of Science degree from the University of Toronto and his Master's and PhD from McGill University. Now while his graduate theses were on synapsids and aquatic diapsids, it would be dinosaurs uh, that would dominate his research career. While still in his PhD program, Phil started a position as curator uh, at the Provincial Museum of Alberta in Edmonton, now the Royal Alberta Museum. Uh, his successful dinosaur fieldwork program in the late 70s and early 80s eventually led to the need for a larger museum uh, and ultimately the creation of the Royal Toronto Museum of Paleontology, uh, where, he was, uh, where he became curator of dinosaurs. Uh, so Phil lived and worked in Drumheller for 23 years before ultimately moving on to continue his research career at the University of Alberta. While at the Tyrrell, some of Phil's most significant work involved the China-Canada Dinosaur Project and the description of the first feathered dinosaurs, cementing birds as living dinosaurs. Throughout his research career, uh, Phil has published more than 350 scientific articles, 175 uh, pop, uh, popular articles, and 20 books. He has supervised or co-supervised more than 30 masters and PhD students. His fieldwork has stretched from Alberta to Argentina, British Columbia to China and Mongolia, and both the Arctic and the Antarctic. Uh, a testament to his career, Phil has won many uh, awards, including the Alberta Order of Excellence, the Explorers Club Medal, the Royal Canadian Geographical Society Gold Medal, the Romer Simpson Medal for the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, and the Roy Chapman Andrews Distinguished, sorry, Roy Chapman Andrews Society Distinguished Explorers Award. Uh, he's also the namesake of the Philip J. Curry Museum in Wembley, Alberta, and also the namesake for no less than nine species of dinosaurs, uh, both body fossils and, and ichnofossils, all theropods, of course. Um, uh, those being uh, Quilmosaurus curiae, uh, Aquilovipes curiae, um, uh, Lim Limavipes curiae, Epichirostenodes curiae, Teratophonius curiae, you're getting the, the, the pattern here, uh, <laughs> Deltapodus curiae, uh, Alberta vernaria curiae, Leoning Venator Curiae, and of course, Philovenator Curiae. Uh, today's talk will highlight some of his ongoing fieldwork uh, research in Mongolia, and the talk is titled Theropod Dinosaurs from the Namaked Formation, uh, Upper Cretaceous of Mongolia. So without further delay, uh, please join me in welcoming Phil to the, to the podium. Well, good morning. Uh, I'll talk about a warmer place mostly today. And uh, um, over the years, uh, I've given a lot of talk. So a lot of you have probably seen this slide. And basically it uh, just cements uh, how I got interested in dinosaurs. Uh, it in fact started off by a uh, plastic dinosaur in a cereal box. And uh, I searched for a long time in Rice Krispies to get the Tyrannosaurus Rex, which I never did get. Um, not, not by the cereal box method anyway. We did collect two originals here in Alberta. That helped a lot. Um, but when I was in grade five, um, I found and read this book all about dinosaurs by Roy Chapman Andrews. The, uh, the neat thing about it is it was a book not just about dinosaurs. It was a book about what it was like to be a paleontologist. And so for me, uh, I was so enamored with the idea that I en ended up deciding right away that I would be a paleontologist uh, looking for dinosaurs. Uh, the following year, uh, I'd been to the Royal Ontario Museum, of course, many times over the years because I lived just outside of Toronto. 
and uh, had noticed that uh, all the dinosaurs came from Alberta. So by the time I was 12 years old, I knew I wanted to be a dinosaur paleontologist in Alberta. And uh, well, that's kind of um, ambitious, we'll say, because at the time there was about half a dozen positions in the entire world where people were paid to work on dinosaurs. But uh, I set out uh, to do that and uh, geared my whole education towards becoming a paleontologist. Um, did I think I was going to end up in Alberta? Well, maybe yes, maybe no, but I kind of thought I'd be teaching biology at a junior college or something like that. And, uh, but being in the place where all those dinosaurs came from, I mean, that was the, the real ambition I had. Um, so I set off that way and uh, ended up working here exactly. Uh, the bizarre thing is that uh, the Andrews book, of course, was about working in the Gobi Desert and uh, the Gobi Desert of both Mongolia and China. And uh, uh, when we were uh, building the Terrell Museum of Paleontology, I had a, an employee, uh, Brian Noble, who asked me one day, he said, well, when you guys finish building the Terrell Museum, what do you want to do? Uh, I just said, I want to go to the Gobi Desert, of course. <laughs> and. Uh, um, up to that point in time, it was impossible to do that because of the politics that uh, existed between the West and the East at the time. So I didn't expect to have that happen either. And then uh, suddenly, uh, three years later, I guess it was, um, I woke up one day in the Gobi Desert with the sun beating down on my head. And I'm thinking, wow, this is just unbelievable. So Andrews wrote a book called Under a Lucky Star, and I think um, I'm very much in the same uh, ilk in that uh, I've been very, very lucky with my career. When we started the Canada-China Dinosaur Project, uh, we worked for five years from 86 to 91 on the project. Uh, the project brought uh, people from China to Alberta to work on dinosaurs here and collect dinosaurs with us in the field, not just Alberta, but also up in the Arctic. And uh, we got to go to China uh, all those times to uh, collect specimens. And uh, in, in all, I think we collected 60 tons of fossils in China. Uh, we're still working on specimens to this day. Uh, and uh, still having a hoot with it. However, uh, by the late 80s, we realized the Chinese uh, really didn't need a lot of assistance from us anymore. And uh, my original goal was, in fact, to go to Mongolia. And so since um, 1989 was my first trip to Mongolia, we've uh, shifted most of our worked to Mongolia and gone on multiple expeditions, uh, multinational. And uh, uh, the area that uh, uh, we do most of our work is in the Namekt Basin, not too far from the Chinese border, in fact. And uh, the reason I like working there is because the material that we get there is, in fact, very closely related to the fossils we find here in Alberta. And so it gives me a different perspective on uh, Alberta fossils. And uh, we still do most of our uh, field work and so on in Alberta. But uh, um, we find things there, and I'll, I'll mention some of these things as I go along, that uh, are a little bit different or are preserved in a different way and give us a different angle on things. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, two formations uh, in this talk mostly. It's in the Megd Formation and the Berengoyet. And uh, originally those were split, uh, but um, uh, it's questionable whether in fact they really should be split. Uh, the Megd Formation is the one that's closest to the material that we find in Alberta along the Red Deer River. Uh, it's very, very rich. Uh, uh, I'd say after Dinosaur Provincial Park, um, the Nemegd Formation has the highest diversity of dinosaurs, and those dinosaurs, in fact, are pretty closely related to ones we find in the Drumheller area, believe it or not. And uh, uh, the Berengoyet is a different environment altogether, um, and uh, consequently we find uh, fewer species of dinosaurs, 
Uh, those dinosaurs were living in, in a different environment, which was tougher for them. And uh, the dinosaurs tend to be small, uh, and they also tend to be less speciose than the ones that we find in the Nemeg Formation. Uh, Davy Berth and uh, Federico Fanti, two other people that you may be familiar with, have worked with us extensively and have clearly shown that uh, um, the two formations, the Nemegd and the Varangoyet, actually interfinger with each other. They're not different formations representing different times. They're different formations in the sense that they represent different kinds of environments. Uh, Jadokta Formation is where Andrews originally worked in the 1920s, and that's where they found the first specimens of Protoceratops and the first specimens of uh, uh, recognizable dinosaur eggs. Um, and there's fewer species there too. It's supposed to represent an older time period, but in fact uh, may also be uh, like the Nemegt and the Barangoyet. Uh, it may in fact be uh, lateral equivalents as far as the time is concerned and that uh, the dinosaurs that lived in the environment of the Judocta Formation was even drier yet. Uh, there are lots, lots of sand dunes and, and uh, uh, intermittent water bodies that uh, uh, they could live on the shores of, but the, uh, the variety of dinosaurs, uh, diversity of dinosaurs, is considerably less than what we see in the other two formations. Um, but we kind of think now that it's quite possible that at least parts of the Judocta Formation are equivalent to the Barangoyet, uh, and uh, the Barangoyet, as I've already said, interfingers with the Nemeg Formation. So uh, this is a great big basin. Uh, essentially what was happening, it was in the center of Asia, and uh, uh, sediments were eroding off the mountains that were building around the basin, and uh, blowing or washing into the center of the basin. And uh, we do have similar uh, environments today that we can look at and we can see that uh, uh, you have different faunas and floras in the different parts of the basins because uh, the amount of water that's available to support this life uh, varies quite a bit from the edge of the basin to the middle of the basin. And that makes sense because water flows downhill and ends up in the middle. Now I'm going to talk about uh, theropod dinosaurs, <coughs> specifically the meat eaters and uh, uh, the meat eaters of the Nemeg Formation and the Barangoyet uh, included because uh, uh, many of them are found in both of those, these formations. Uh, but uh, uh, as you can see, I've listed here uh, two, four, six, seven families. Of those seven families, Six of them are in Alberta as well. Um, so that's how close uh, the environments uh, probably were, or at least uh, uh, the animals which uh, could move across into North America through uh, Siberia and Alaska and uh, vice versa. So some of these animals may have originated in North America and some of them may have originated in Asia. There's always a lot of argument about that, but the fossil record isn't always perfect, uh, we'll say. And uh, um, so there's always new things that we have to discover. Now I'm not going to talk about all of these uh, dinosaurs, that would just be overwhelming. I could talk about all of these dinosaurs because we've collected them all. Uh, but uh, um, I'll talk about some of the more interesting and fun ones. Oviraptorids um, were one of the groups of dinosaurs that uh, were discovered first um, by the American Museum when they worked in Mongolia in 1923. And uh, uh, Oviraptorosaurs includes multiple families. And uh, those multiple families include the Avamimids, Caudipteryx, which is a, a feathered dinosaur that uh, we worked on from China. The Canignathids, which are from Alberta mostly, but have only recently been discovered in uh, Mongolia. And uh, the Oviraptorids themselves. And uh, they have these peculiar skulls, the, the eye in the middle of the skull. Uh, here's a beak at the front of the skull. This is the attachment to the lower jaw. Uh, they've lost their teeth for the most part. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions in these. 
Um, and uh, when the first specimen was found at the Flaming Cliffs in 1923, it was thought that uh, it was uh, stealing eggs from a nest. And that's because the uh, oviraptor was in fact lying on a nest of eggs and uh, they had assumed that those eggs were from protoceratops and they assumed that because most of the skeletons they find at this site are protoceratops skeletons um, protoceratops uh, as you might guess by the name or already know protoceratops is sort of a primitive ceratopsid um, ceratopsids are the ones around here but um, the uh, protoceratopsians uh, are very, very common here. There's probably been a thousand skulls of protoceratops collected at this, uh, this particular site. And it's not very big. It's only about seven kilometers long uh, stretch of cliffs. And uh, so given the number of eggs they found here, they just assumed they were protoceratops eggs. The oviraptor was on top of the nest of protoceratops eggs, or what they thought was protoceratops eggs. And so they called it oviraptor, which means uh, egg thief. Um, and uh, uh, the species name was Phyloceratops, that loved ceratopsians. So um, that was a pretty good idea at the time. And uh, uh, over the years, uh, many other specimens have been found of uh, related animals in uh, China and Mongolia and uh, better preserved than the original specimen, which was pretty badly crushed. Uh, but when we worked on the Canada-China Dinosaur Project, one of the things we found was a nest of the so-called protoceratopsian eggs, uh, two layers deep, and uh, on top of the nest of eggs were these hollow bones that we knew right away were uh, theropod bones. And as we excavated, we realized that we had a uh, another oviraptor. And uh, the bizarre thing was that, um, you know, you, you think about it, and uh, the interpretation on the original nest was that the oviraptor was trying to steal the eggs of the protoceratops, protoceratops from a nest, and a sandstorm came up and buried it uh, with its prey. Well, you don't expect that to happen more than once. That's, that's a pretty unusual circumstance. Uh, animals are usually a little bit smarter than to die with their food. Uh, it made a lot more sense to me that uh, uh, probably the oviraptor we found in China was in fact sitting on a nest of its own eggs. And that uh, this was in fact uh, a mother uh, baby kind of a situation. Now, the eggs were empty, we didn't have any embryos, so we couldn't prove it. But uh, the following year in Mongolia, uh, the American Museum of Natural History, which still works in Mongolia, uh, found this nest. And here's the eggs, you can see around the edge. And the mother, in fact, was like our nest, sitting right on the nest of eggs. And uh, um, the eggs uh, are laid two at a time. And uh, uh, basically, I think what was happening is the mother was standing in one spot, laying two eggs, turning, laying two more eggs, turning, laying two more eggs. And at the same time she was doing that, and this shows very beautifully in the Chinese nests that we collected, she was taking sand with her hands and scooping them up on the eggs. And so once the circle closed once, um, these bottom eggs would be partially buried in sand and she would put a second layer on. And there are some nests that are found in Mongolia and China which indicate there is up to three layers deep of these eggs in the spiral. The mother's feet are in fact in the center of the nest, the hands are stretched out on the sides. Once we found feathered dinosaurs then some things made sense because whereas the nest would have been protected by her chest here and her hips here. Uh, in fact, the eggs on the side, on either side, uh, were still exposed to the element. And it may well be that the long feathers developed behind the arms of these uh, dinosaurs as a way of uh, covering and protecting those eggs on the side. So um, 
the American Museum not only found this nest, this is uh, the one called Big Mama, uh, but they found two other nests as well with the mother on top. And then to add to it, uh, in Mongolia, uh, we were working in the Baron Goyet Formation. Um, this is the Nemeg Formation here. And uh, uh, at this level uh, down here, just, just uh, on the, the uh, contact between uh, the Baron Goyet and the Nemeg Formation, we found a nest of eggs as well. And uh, guess what? There was another mother on top. And uh, the mother, though, was not over after. The mother was a related form called Nemegtomaya. And Nemegtomaya is an over afterid that's found both in the Nemeg formation and the Baron Goyet. So it made perfect sense. Um, also in Mongolia, uh, we've collected uh, other specimens of over afterids. They're pretty common in that part of the world. Uh, but this is one that we didn't collect. Um, you can see the orbit in the middle here. Um, this is a different form in the sense that the crest on the animal is very large and well developed. And uh, um, we feel this is a different species altogether, so it took the name Oxoka. Uh, Greg Funston was the lead author on this. Greg was one of my students at the University of Alberta. Um, 2018, we were working uh, another area in the Nemeg Formation and uh, uh, we weren't having an awful lot of luck. We were finding some good specimens, but then suddenly um, one of our colleagues uh, found a few bones in this area and the few bones developed into more bones and more bones and more bones and we ended up with nine skeletons of an Overapterid, uh, which was pretty small, much smaller than Overapterid itself. Uh, it's a dinosaur that's had a name for quite some time. It's called Conqueraptor, but uh, very close related. And uh, this is a uh, specimen uh, we just finished preparation on last year. And uh, uh, materials, the cast has come over now to uh, uh, Edmonton, and we're working on a paper for uh, trying to resolve uh, the name of this particular dinosaur, Conqueraptor, because uh, it's gone through a lot of uh, ups and downs over the years with another dinosaur that ended up being um, misidentified as well. It might be the same dinosaur, but maybe only at some specimens that are. These are Canignathids. Canignathids are related to Overaptorids. When you look at them, you can see they look a lot like Overaptorids. They're almost certainly feathered dinosaurs. Uh, we have a lot of indications of that. First discovered in Alberta in 1940, uh, identified or misidentified as birds, um, pretty big birds at that though, about my size. And uh, uh, now we have a pretty good idea what the cane ignathids are like in Alberta. Uh, and we thought that uh, cane ignathids were only found in North America and over afterwards were only found in Asia. But recently we've discovered that in fact Kenignathids are also in Mongolia and other countries in Asia. Um, they look a little bit different. This is actually one from uh, Mongolia. It's called um, Nomingia. Uh, it's one of the ones we named. Um, it's uh, got this beautiful fan of feathers at the end. Uh, that's speculation. But uh, there's lots of reasons to think that it's there because of the end of the tail it looks an awful lot like a bird tail. Um, another group of dinosaurs that's pretty cool are the Avamimids. Uh, Avamimids are about the size of chickens and turkeys, and uh, they're they're really tiny. Uh, they were first found by the Russians in uh, 1980. Um, they're very specialized when you look at the vertebrae or the claws, or, or just about anything in their body. Uh, they look more like birds than anything else. So avi uh, means bird, of course. Mimid means uh, mimics. So avimimids, though, uh, weren't known from very much cranial material until recently. Um, some of the Japanese expeditions and our expeditions have found cranial material. And uh, so we've resolved more or less what the skull looks like now. Uh, but uh, I think it was 2007, 
Uh, we were working in Nemegd. Um, Nemegd is a locality. Uh, the mountain in the background that you see there is Nemegd Mountain. Uh, this is Nemegd Formation. And uh, um, we've suffered a lot from poachers over the years. Um, so from about the year 2000 until um, after the uh, Tarbosaurus was seized in New York City and uh, uh, some people went to jail and specimens started being returned to China and so on. Uh, but uh, we found an area that had been poached and the area was just covered with bones. And uh, uh, whereas before we'd only found avimimids one at a time, in fact, this time we found the remains of 18 individuals. And uh, um, it looked like a uh, pile of bones behind uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken or something. Uh, it was quite incredible. And so we had a variety of uh, specimens for the first time. And we realized that these things, uh, these little bird-like animals, which are related to Oviraptor distantly, uh, were in fact um, uh, related to uh, some specimens that we have here in Alberta too, but, uh, but that in fact they, they, they are little chicken-like animals that were pretty common in the Nemegd Formation and actually the uh, other formations in that region as well. So, neat little animal. Um, you're probably familiar with Velociraptor. Uh, to me, this is one of the most spectacular specimens that's ever been found. Um, this is a Velociraptor locked in combat with the Protoceratops. Here's the Protoceratops. The uh, Velociraptor has its uh, foot, which I can't see from this angle, um, more or less in the side of the body of the animal with its big claw uh, on its foot. But the Protoceratops has the Velociraptor arm in its mouth. And uh, my interpretation of the site is that the uh, Velociraptor was hunting behind a sand dune uh, during a sandstorm that it found the Protoceratops and attacked it. The Protoceratops was too big for it. And um, before the Velociraptor was able, able to kill the Protoceratops, um, the uh, Protoceratops locked its jaws on the arm of the Velociraptor. And because the sand was coming over the top of the dune, and uh, uh, buried the animals too deeply. Uh, not only the Velociraptor, uh, or sorry, the Protoceratops died uh, in suffocation and probably also from its wounds, but the Velociraptor was trapped and couldn't get away either. And uh, um, we know this kind of thing does happen today, that uh, hyenas will in fact hunt behind sand dunes in the Sahara Desert uh, during storms because they know that um, uh, a lot of uh, different types of antelope and so on will hunker down behind the dunes to try and escape the ferocity of the sandstorm. And uh, then they can approach them. But it doesn't always work out well, but it works out well for us as paleontologists. So we do find Velociraptor remains and uh, relatives of Velociraptor. Uh, we're working on one right now that's probably a new species. We're also working on old specimens collected by previous expeditions, including one Russian expedition from 1948. And uh, um, there's quite a variety of these animals, as you may have noticed in that first list I showed. But this one was really weird. This is a specimen that turned up in Europe. It was collected in Mongolia. And uh, I was part of the team that described it as Halskaraptor. And uh, it's an animal with a really long neck. It's not very big. It's about the size of a chicken. And uh, it has a lot of peculiar adaptations in its body. Um, when this uh, paper came out, um, we were accused of uh, fabricating the specimen. Uh, it is taking uh, multiple specimens uh, and putting them all together into this uh, chimera uh, and, uh, well, we kind of thought that too. So actually the thing had gone through synchrotron uh, analysis. It had gone through all kinds of things to try and show that it was one single specimen um, and uh, that it is a very well-preserved specimen. It's a beautiful specimen, actually. Um, and uh, 
then um, around the time that this was coming to fold, uh, this is one of our localities in Mongolia. Again, this is uh, a combination of Baron Goyet and the Meg formations. It's a place called Hirmin Sav. Uh, I think one of the most beautiful places in the Gobi Desert. But uh, um, in uh, 2008, uh, Robin Sissons, uh, who is one of our technicians in Edmonton, uh, found a little specimen that at first we thought was a lizard. Um, so we collected it and took it back. It uh, actually sat in uh, Korea for a couple of years because at that time we were working as part of the um, Korea-Mongolia International Dinosaur Project. And so many of the specimens were uh, in Korea. But when it got prepared, then we didn't know what to do with it because it was such a weird looking animal. And uh, uh, the skull, as you can see, is especially weird. Uh, we knew at that point it wasn't a lizard anymore. Uh, we thought maybe it was a troodontid uh, because of some things in its skeleton. Uh, but ultimately, uh, when we did the phylogenetic analysis, it turned out to be related to Velociraptor. It's one of the dromaeosaurs. And uh, it only made sense once the uh, paper came out on Halskoraptor because here was, in fact, another example of the same kind of dinosaur. Uh, very, very long neck. It had specializations in its ribs that suggested it was, in fact, an aquatic animal. Uh, the ribs were pachyostotic. They were kind of flattened um, to be um, <clears throat> streamlined for when it was swinging through the water. And uh, so this uh, got a new name. Uh, Nato venator and uh, um, beautiful little animal um, and a beautiful little specimen, but uh, not, not what we expected to find in, in the Gobi Desert in the Namek Formation. Um, you'll recognize this specimen. Uh, the specimen collected down in Dinosaur Provincial Park back in 1995. Uh, still one of the very best specimens ever found uh, of this type of dinosaur. But a related animal, as it turns out, is represented by this pair of arms. And uh, when these arms were discovered uh, in 1965 by a Polish-Mongolian expedition, uh, only the arms were discovered and fragments of a few ribs, uh, gastralia, and uh, vertebrae, but it was mostly the arms. And uh, um, the arms... Uh, for a long time, attracted a lot of attention and a lot of controversy. Uh, people recognized that it was from a carnivorous dinosaur of some kind, a theropod dinosaur, um, but there was argument as to whether it was from an ornithomimid or a therozinosaurid, and of course people who really wanted to make it spectacular um, would compare it with uh, tyrannosaurs, which have really short arms, and saying, wow, tyrannosaur is this big, uh, but the arms are only this big. Can you imagine what this animal would have been like? Um, so that went on for a long, long time. And it's one of the dinosaurs uh, we've always kept our eyes open for in the Namaked Formation. And uh, um, finally, in 2008, we rediscovered the site where the original specimen had been collected. And uh, we did find more bone, not a lot, though. Uh, but uh, it uh, uh, garnered a fair bit of publicity because people are really interested in Dinochirus. They really want to know what it is. And uh, um, the following year, we found another poach site, and that's this one. And this was uh, um, uh, Nemeg Formation again. Uh, the poachers, what they usually do, unfortunately, is they smash up the specimens. Uh, they're trying to get the skulls, hands, and feet, uh, which are the least amount of effort in terms of collection, uh, but bring the most money. And uh, uh, very often what they'll do is just take the rest of the specimen and throw it down the hill. Uh, we went to this site. It had been found by uh, Young Nam Lee, and uh, Young thought it was a Tarbosaurus. He knew I was interested in uh, Tyrannosaurus and especially Tarbosaurus. I'll explain why in a bit. 
Um, and so he took me to it, and I, I took notes about the quarry and everything, and then we walked away. And as I was walking away, I was thinking, you know, there's something wrong with this. And so later that day, we went back to the site, and uh, I took a more careful look at all the broken bone and realized that it wasn't a Tarbosaurus. It was a big theropod, for sure, uh, but it wasn't Tarbosaurus. And uh, so that meant it could only be either Dinochirus or Therizinosaurus. And uh, so we started uh, um, working in the site. And uh, uh, one of the interesting things is we found all this money. Um, <clears throat> poachers uh, tend to mark their sites sometimes with uh, Mongolian money, um, thanking the gods, I guess, for their good fortune in finding the specimen. And uh, all of these Mongolian money notes, uh, which are worth only pennies, uh, they were all dated 2002 or later. And so we knew that the uh, specimen had probably been dug up in 2002, about seven years before we had refound it. And then we started putting things together. And uh, uh, we got an arm together and realized that we definitely had Dinochirus. And so this was the first skeleton uh, recognizable as Dinochirus. Um, so it was a really important find. Um, the specimen went to Korea for preparation. And uh, as it was in preparation, we realized we'd in fact collected another one as well uh, the year before, but hadn't recognized what it was. But it was another poached specimen. And uh, um, around that time, <coughs> I got a phone call from a colleague in uh, Belgium uh, Pasqu Pascal Godefroyd, and uh, he knew that we had refound the original site uh, that the Poles had worked, and he said, I think you're going to be interested in this, in a warehouse in Germany uh, from a professional uh, fossil salesman. He had seen something that he thought might be Dinochirus. And so we went to Belgium. Uh, and we got to see uh, the skull, as well as hands and feet, of a very unusual dinosaur. Um, and uh, we were convinced right from the beginning that this was, in fact, the poached specimen that uh, we had found uh, and collected the rest of. Um, and uh, the interesting thing was that, um, this is what the skull looks like from the side, just uh, lower jaw, I, uh, the front of the nose, the, uh, the front is actually expanded into a beak. It looks more like a duckbill dinosaur than it looks like a meat-eating dinosaur. But really, all the characters of this animal say it's a, an ornithomimid of a sort. And, uh, but what was fun was there were some bones that we collected that, in fact, fit completely onto the hands and feet of the specimen that was in uh, Belgium. So we could take the uh, next toe bone, for example, uh, from Belgium and fit it into this impression in the rock. And uh, uh, we had things from both the hands and the feet that showed this was, in fact, exactly the same specimen. And uh, um, very interesting dinosaur, though. Um, even though it's an ornithomimid, uh, it has uh, gastroliths inside its uh, stomach region. Gastrolis suggests usually that it's a plant-eating animal. Um, we've kind of thought that uh, uh, maybe ornithomimids were a little bit different and they might have been omnivores, uh, but we also found fish bones suggesting this animal was eating fish. Um, so the paper came out on that one pretty quick, and this is a reconstruction by Michael Skrepnik. Um, showing what the animal may have looked like. Uh, we think that the evidence from the tail uh, suggests that the animal had feathers on parts of its body. Uh, it has very tall spines, kind of like a Spinosaurus that way. It has this uh, flattened uh, duck-like skull, uh, suggesting it's like a hadrosaur. The feet uh, look very much like hadrosaur feet as well. Um, but uh, all in all, this is definitely an ornithomimid. And so we ended up resolving that uh, mystery that had been there for quite some time. 
as I said, uh, we felt that we have uh, two specimens uh, that went into the paper. And uh, this is a reconstruction done on the basis of the uh, specimen from Belgium. Uh, was then given back to Mongolia and uh, reunited with the skeleton that we had collected uh, from the poached quarry and uh, uh, was eventually cast and put on display in, in Tokyo. Uh, as you know, I like Tyrannosaurus, many of you, and uh, uh, it's incredible uh, working in Mongolia because the number of Tyrannosaurus that we find there is astronomical. And uh, um, this is uh, a nice skull that we uh, collected in partial skeleton uh, around the year 2000. Um, when we were collecting it, we realized that uh, part of the skull had in fact been pushed into the mud. And uh, it was about half a meter deeper into the sandy mud uh, than the back of the skull and the skeleton and it didn't make any sense at first. But uh, eventually we found, uh, by cleaning off the layer uh, off to the side here were these gigantic footprints. And uh, the footprints are from a duckbill dinosaur. And uh, that was like a light going on for us because up to that point, we had never seen footprints in the Nemeg Formation. And in fact, the Russians have worked there, the Americans have worked there, the Japanese have worked there. Um, poles worked there. Nobody had seen them. Um, it was quite bizarre, but uh, when we saw these, then the light went on, and we started looking around, and we found thousands and thousands and thousands of well-preserved um, footprints in the area. Um, we've collected a lot of uh, Tarbosaurus over the years. In fact, we've seen 111 quarries at this point, as of last year, uh, of Tarbosaurus in the field. And that's not the total number of Tarbosaurus either. That's just the ones we've seen the quarries of. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of specimens that were collected and are in the museums in either Ulaanbaatar or Moscow or Warsaw. And so I forget the number, it's, it's about 150 something. And uh, Tarbosaurus, as a Tyrannosaur, um, is, of course, an obvious carnivore. And it doesn't make sense to find that many specimens when all you're finding is uh, um, an equivalent number of plant-eating dinosaurs. So something's wrong with the ecosystem there in terms of the preservation of fossils because it favors the preservation of these big Tyrannosaurs. And uh, um, so we've done some work on it, and uh, we in fact find that uh, if you measure all the specimens and compare them with each other, uh, most of the specimens are medium-sized animals. Uh, these are the young animals, these are the very old animals, they're much more rare. And uh, this kind of a distribution uh, isn't representative of uh, um, an attritional death assemblage, it's more or less what we expect to see if it's a catastrophic death assemblage of some kind. So whatever was happening in the Nemeg Formation at that time was catastrophically killing these Tyrannosaurs. And uh, that fits with a couple of the theories we've come up with over the years, uh, but we still don't have the final answer on this. So I'll keep looking at Tarbosaurus skeletons till I can't do it anymore. Um, but I did mention the footprint sites, and uh, once we realized footprints were there, we started looking around. And here's a layer from the Nemeg formation of Nemeg. And you'll notice at the bottom of the layer, you have all these um, depressions in the layer, which are actually um, sand filled footprints. And we're getting one footprint basically every meter. Uh, some of these beds extend for more than a kilometer. We're getting thousands and thousands and thousands of footprints. Here's another layer, not as well, not as obvious. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, when you look at and identify these footprints, which are beautifully preserved, uh, we find that <coughs> Tarbosaurus only makes up about 5% of the footprints. 
that the majority of footprints are made by uh, hadrosaurs and sauropods, and uh, the proportions of uh, uh, Tarbosaurus uh, to the herbivores is about the same as what we see in Dinosaur Provincial Park. It's about 5 to 10 percent. Um, the skeletons come from these layers, and in these layers it's 50 percent Tarbosaurus and 50 percent other animals. These layers, Tarbosaurus is 5 percent. This layer, 50 percent Tarbosaurus. This layer, 5 percent. This layer, um, back to 50 percent. Um, so it's quite obvious that uh, uh, the layers represented by the footprints are telling a very different story than the layers in between them. And uh, um, we think that uh, this is just uh, a representation of the normal um, composition of the ecosystem at the time and that something catastrophic is happening at these other layers that is uh, selectively killing Tarbosaurus. And uh, just to show you a couple of the footprints, uh, <coughs> these are uh, Tarbosaur footprints, uh, very well preserved. Here's a partial Tarbosaur foot. Uh, many of the Tarbosaur footprints actually have uh, skin impressions on the bottom. And uh, on this one, you can see claw marks uh, as well at the ends of the toes. Um, I have to say that uh, um, it's an incredible place to work. Uh, I think it's an incredible place, especially in the context of the similarities we have with Alberta. Uh, it's very interesting that um, uh, two sites in the world uh, have about uh, five to 10 percent of all known species of dinosaurs. And those two sites are Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta and uh, the Namegd Valley in Mongolia. And uh, um, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, we have species that are not, not species, sorry, genera, uh, like the Hadrosaurus sorolophus, which is found in the Drumheller area, is also found in Mongolia. We have very closely related animals like Tarbosaurus and Tyrannosaurus rex. And uh, that shows a similarity in that there was, in fact, sort of uh, interchange between North America and Asia at the time that these beds were laid down in both Mongolia and Alberta. But because of the differences, we can learn things uh, in each of these sites that help us understand better what's going on in the other sites. So Namegd is uh, very similar to what we find in Dinosaur Park or here in the Drumheller area, but it's not the same. And uh, I'm trying to figure out exactly what's going on um, keeps me going, I would say. So uh, with that, I'll say thank you very much.